Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's uh, topic is five tips to improve food safety leadership with Britta Ball. Um, Britta will be joining us shortly, but first I'm going to play the sponsor's ads. Uh, if you tell us where you're joining from, type in the sidebar. It'd be lovely to hear it. So I'll be back after the ads. We're back. Hi, Britta. <laughs> Hello. Morning. Good, morning. good afternoon. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> um, perfect timing. Um, and uh, I've got COVID, by the way. Um, oh, dear. I know. I started with it on uh, Monday, but uh, you can't catch it through uh, the internet. Thanks. That's right. Yes. So uh, all precautions taken. So um, yeah, let us know where you're joining the sidebar, as always, from all over the world. It's lovely to see you. And uh, we're going to be uh, learning about uh, leadership today. So let's get your slides up. I'll be back for the Q&A later. And I'll hand you over to Britta. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Simon, for uh, for being here and hosting this with the sponsors. I really appreciate the opportunity to be connecting with uh, hundreds of people from around the world to talk about food safety leadership. Uh, we, you know, we spent some years talking about food safety culture and and the importance of organizational culture that supports food safety, but we not very often had talked about the the importance of leadership which is required to get the positive food safety cultures that we're looking for. And so this is a great opportunity to, to talk to people uh, about that. And so by the end of the session, I'd like you to have five tips to improve food safety leadership in your organization. And just to, to start off, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background, of my background, so that you, you have an understanding of why I'm somebody that's qualified to talk about food safety leadership. I, I started my career in, in, food, in food science, or I started my undergrad in food science, and from there I went to, get, got involved in inspection and, and of, of uh, farms and of of dairy plants. I was focused on, on the dairy operation. I'd also worked in, I had several jobs in, in the, the dairy industry be, before, before that. And then after I graduated, uh, sorry, after I, then I was in inspection and in inspection of uh, farms and dairy plants, and then I moved to Kraft Foods and I worked at Kraft Foods in Ingleside 
which is a cheese cutting and wrapping operation. From there, then I left. I left there and uh, and went to teach at Kempville College, Kempville Agricultural College, where I taught milk quality and processing and a number of other courses, communications and English, and uh, and some other courses related to 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 the to continue education for for the industry. And and when I was when I was there, uh, then I applied for and got a job working in rural extension. And extension is a is a common word used in the United States. Um, not sure wh how where it is used elsewhere in the world. It was used commonly in Canada as well. Now we use the phrase technology transfer uh, or K KTT knowledge or knowledge tr technology transfer knowledge mobilization, those kinds of things. My area was in, in, the, in the agricultural sector and, and I worked, I worked in, in rural, rural Ontario, focusing on leadership and organization development. And I spent a number of years working in leadership and organization development. And that's where I learned a whole lot more skills about well, exactly that leadership, organization development, communications, uh, negotiation, uh, the whole raft of things. And what I what my job was, was to help organizations in the rural communities to develop them. So I developed my skills and I then helped organizations in the rural community as a rural community advisor and then became an economic development consultant working in in. In, in again in the rural communities. I also worked in Gambia and West Africa and was a manager of a food preservation project there. So, so I worked, that was with the Ontario government, that, that role in extension. I got a, a master's in rural extension studies, which is really about leadership, and, which is really about adult education. And my focus, my research focus was on leadership, leadership and leadership development training. And and then I then I continued working at the Ontario government. My job changed. I was in communications in the Ontario government because of of how the government decided to change things. So I went into communications. And then after I worked in communications and food safety, uh, food safety policy development, and in innovation risk management, in as a laboratory analyst looking at looking at the. Uh, the, making sure that the laboratory tests were being conducted properly across uh, for for samples that were that the Ontario government needed, and and then I I decided that I want to change do a shift in my career and get back into the food safety. So I did a master's in food safety and quality assurance, and and then my PhD related to that, and and essentially what I was working on was the factors that influence workers to follow food safety management systems. And, and so following that then, or, or while I was doing my graduate work in food safety, I worked at the University of Guelph. I taught food sanitation and quality control. I was the, the director of the National Food Safety Network. And, and, I, and I did some, I did a number of, uh, of other things supporting the, the department while part time, while I was work, while I was uh, studying part time. Well, actually, I was supposed to be studying full time, but it turned out I was studying part time because I was doing all these other things. And then after I graduated, I worked for Food Banks Canada as a program manager for food safety in work at Food Banks Canada, and and started my own company, Breeder Ball and Associates. And I also have Food Banks Canada is one of my one of my clients in that. So I wanted to just give you that background because I wanted to let you know that I've got a food science background. I am solidly a food scientist and a food safety specialist from production all the way to, and I will even say from, I would say from farm to fork because it, it may, perhaps I haven't been working in the food, food service sector, but I know from preparing food in my, in, in my own home and for guests and other things that not, haven't done any major catering, but done some minor catering for large groups, I, I know the importance of food safety all the way across the, the, the food chain. So I, like I said, I wanted to bring that to, to you so I'll let you know that I've got a food safety background, but also that I have a solid background in leadership 
and organization development. And, and as an extension agent, my role was change uh, as a change agent. And so that's what we always talked about. We, we talked about work, working ourselves out of, out of a job so that we would move on to the next job to help others then improve their situation in their organizations. So it would help one organization change, implement the changes that they needed to make, and then and move on to another, an, another organization. So that's what we meant when we were talking about being change agents. So all the way along, as I was, as I was doing, doing the work in, in rural Ontario, I realized that it wasn't just that, that learning for itself wasn't, wasn't this, that wasn't the end, the end goal. The end goal was to have behavior change. The end goal was have to have, to have some improvement in whatever it was that we, people were learning about. So they were learning about leadership because they wanted to improve their leadership skills and then apply those leadership skills in their situation. Whatever the learning was about, it was always about behavior change. And so that's an important, that's an important uh, thing to remember as we're going, uh, you know, as we're going on. So it's always about behavior change. We're looking at changing habits to move forward in, in, uh, in, in the goals that we would like to achieve. So in this, in this webinar, what I'd like to focus on, I'd like to focus on leadership styles, on the difference between management and leadership, and, and, and how, to, how to incorporate food safety or not. When we're, when, we're in food in, we're in, when we're in the food industry, sometimes we maybe don't want to make food safety the focus. Maybe we need to make something else the focus, even though we're food safety specialists. And I'll I'll explain that later as we come, and and then and then I wanted to then end with communicating food safety, and and how to go about that and 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 why why to do that and with that also in, comes in change change management. So what I'd like to do I'd like you to get started. I'd like you to start by by identifying and typing in the chat for me. And I'll, as you're typing in the chat, I will, I will see if I can read them, uh, read the things. Uh, so what characteristics do you identify in leaders? So if you're thinking of a leader, what kind of characteristics are you expecting to see? Of a, a good leader, let, let's say. You can type in the chat. Oh, I, I, there, there we've got people typing in the chat and I've... Uh, and I've missed them. So, is the chat is the chat open? Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, lots of uh, comments coming in. Uh, visualization, confidence, accountability, lead the example, charisma, problem solving, self confidence, good communication, honesty, lead by example, uh, honesty again. Uh, let's see. Uh, Comprehend, making decisions, asking questions, providing support and guidance, consistent, calm, preventive, open-minded, empathy, teamwork, trust, approachable, integrity, charismatic, good listener, good communicator, action, patient, reliable, team player, ability to communicate. Um, All right. Yeah, these are really good ones. Yes, that's... that's uh... That so yes yeah, so we we have a number of these I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you can read these uh, Simon because they're going faster than I can manage. <laughs> yeah. I on empathy and uh, being a mentor and having yeah. problem solving skills. Motivating and uh, inspiring and communicating and being trustworthy and honest and yeah. Yes. So having integrity yeah. and and um, and having the qualities that we want to we want to be looking towards and. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. These are the kinds of things that we're looking for to, for for leaders, and 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 I'm and I'm pleased with the that the uh, that the comments that we're people are providing are actually focused on on the kinds of characteristics we think about when we think about leadership, as opposed to management or managership, and 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 so let me just go on to the, this part of why I wanted to ask you about leadership qualities, because management is slightly different than leadership. When we, 
when we're in positions in organizations and whatever our whatever our title might might, might be called a manager or me might be called a, a chief something something a chief executive officer or a vice president or something and but what what we whatever our director whatever our roles are when we're in positions in organizations in business organizations we will have a management role and we will have a leadership role and in certain levels we will have greater leadership roles and or other and others we will have greater management roles so in our management role we'll be looking at we'll be doing the planning for the year we'll be doing budgeting we'll be organizing organizing things we'll be putting or having or encourage getting our 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 uh, uh, support people to to organize things with us uh, with our direction um, we might be staffing we might be doing some problem solving and measuring and, and and measuring results looking at the kpis that we've got i don't know if you can hear that but my my dog just decided to play with a squeaky toy so if there is some squeaking in the background that's that's my dog thanks, for, actually, cla thanks for clarifying <laughs> yeah I've, I've actually trained her in a to to bring me toys so that so that so that I would throw them from my desk and so that's why she comes back and forth <laughs> so anyway uh, so uh so we're so we're measuring when I'm talking about measuring uh, looking at KPIs are we on track for are we on track for whatever our 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 um, key performance indicators are and management is doing what we know how to do things, doing the things that we know how to do. Management is producing dependable, reliable results. That's what management is about. Leadership, on the other hand, is, is more strategic. It's, it's establishing the direction, not following the direction. So when I'm doing my leadership stuff, I'm, I'm got the vision, I'm, I'm, creating the vision i'm creating the direction that we're going to be going to and then in the management side i'm going to be following i mean making sure that we're we're planning and budgeting and organizing for that direction that's been that's been set we're going to be aligning i i'm going to be looking at in a leadership role i'm going to be aligning people um making sure that we have looking at looking at who is going to be needed for the kinds of the kinds of uh, direct the, the direction that we've identified and I'm going to be uh, helping to align them get them on board to it I'm going to be motivating people I'm going to be inspiring people I mean mobilizing people to achieve in this case astonishing results and I'll give this credit to Cotter uh, who's who wrote this this is I took this out of uh, out of one of one of his books on change management. So mobilizing people to achieve astonishing results and propelling us, our organization, into the future. So that's what leadership is about. And, and the people who, who, um, who were talking about, you know, integrity or being a role model or val adding value and, you know, and leading by example and, and, and having empathy, those are the kinds of things that we're going to be doing when we, have, when we are in a leadership role or when we're doing our leadership kinds of things. An important thing about leadership is that if you are a leader and you you have to have followers, you can't lead if there's nobody to follow. And so leaders will have followers. And and that's an important thing. So the the managers, managers won't necessarily have followers they will have people doing some work but they may, people may not be following a manager they're just doing what the manager is asking them to do when they're a leader and they're the, even if they're in a manager role when they're a leader people will be motivated differently than if they've just got somebody who is who is a, an administrator who, who doesn't doesn't have that motivating uh motivating charisma or uh, isn't inspiring. So that's that's why I wanted to talk about the difference between management and leadership in here. Both are both are important, both are needed. But uh, this we're going to focus on leadership and and what and what that what what that is. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a history of 
of uh, leadership theory. And hold on a second, I'm going to have to open another slide because my notes are in this slide. My notes are in the uh, in the my notes are on the note section. And all right, so it, the the there are different leadership theories and that 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 were started to be worked on and they, I guess people decided they had they had time to focus on what leadership was and uh, and so in the 1840s there was the great man theory the idea of the great man theory is that people were born men were born leaders they didn't talk about women being leaders at the time but that's as a that's why they called it the great man theory people were born leaders they had innate personality traits and characteristics that would make them effective leaders and those effective leaders would achieve greatness by divine design. And people, you know, men, there were men such as Mahatma Gandhi or Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte, Julius Caesar, Abraham Lincoln. These were people, these were men. Again, we go back to men, and we're just, uh, they, they, they were men that were identified as being great men at, this, at the time that this theory had come about. And then, then somebody well, well, wait a minute, hold on. Maybe, maybe by the 1930s, somebody said, well, people were saying, I'm not so sure that 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 they're all innate characteristics. Maybe they can be acquired. Maybe people can learn the characteristics. So there were studies of leaders to identify the mental uh, traits, the social traits, the physical traits, because it, it, physical traits, oddly enough, if you were a tall, uh, tall and muscular, well, then you would be a better leader than if you weren't tall and muscular. So, so those were the kinds of things that, that the researchers were looking at in 1930s and 1940s. These were the trait theories where they're trying to identify the characteristics, whether they were innate or they were learned. Uh, they still wanted to identify the traits that were common among leaders. And most of the research that was done was in military because they were, that was an easy way to access men who were in leadership roles because they, so, so that was, that was just where a lot of the research was done. And then because the military also was interested in it, they wanted to know, well, okay, well, who, who are the leaders going to be? Who, who are the leaders? Can, what, we need to identify the characteristics so that we can groom, groom people better, be a, do a better job at finding our leaders. And so a, anyway, so the, uh, the, the, it, by the 1950s, though, they couldn't find, the researchers couldn't find a consistent set of traits. So no surprise, because they were looking at things that were innate and or acquired, and they were, but they were really looking at something that was consistent and wasn't, wasn't going to be used for leadership. Although from this research, they did find that there were key personality uh, characteristics and perform, personal performance and team development things. So there are there are uh, characteristics that are that are are from from this type of trait theory. There are characteristics that are now used for for personality tests or or performance personal performance tests. So you may find some of the traits that that were originally in those theories uh, being used now in in uh, in different personality tests. By the 1940s and 50s, behavioral uh, theories came about, and this was essentially that that uh, that the idea that skills can be developed, the behaviors that demonstrate a leader, or that the the, the, the the sorry, let me try that one again that skills can be developed and behaviors demonstrate that a leader is the basis for management and leadership training. Sorry, let me, I got to change that. I, I'm reading my notes and I didn't put in, I didn't put in proper punctuation. <laughs> so the idea is that skills can be developed. Behaviors, de behaviors that demonstrate a leader have become the basis for management and leadership training programs. And, and one model of this behavioral, behavioral theory is, is on, task-oriented behaviors and relationship-oriented behaviors. So you may actually hear people saying, well, I'm, ta I'm task-oriented or I'm, uh, I'm relationship-oriented. And there was a, a model on that that, that, that was uh, basically, you can put it on a sort of a, a, a grid on the y, on, on one axis 
is uh, relationship oriented and the other axis is task oriented and and if you were both task and and relationship oriented well then 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 that would then that would put you at, at the the top right hand corner of the of that 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 grid as it would be working out but when people were they, there'd be little little questionnaires you would fill that fill out the questionnaire and you would find out whether you were task oriented or behavior oriented a lot of technical people are task oriented and so uh, but mo people who are work more in the in the social services kinds of things might be more are more likely to be more more relationship oriented but the, the important thing in here is that there's a balance that's required because you can't be totally task oriented because you'll alienate all your all the people working around you you may even know some examples of people who are so task oriented that that they're that they're miserable to be around oh and there may be people who are so relationship oriented that they don't get much done they're so focused on the relationship side of things that they they're not focused on they're not focused on getting getting the task done and reaching the goals that have been set. So the the task oriented, like I said, facilitates goal accomplishments, and and the and the relationships help subordinates. If you're a manager, that helps subordinates feel comfortable with themselves, their peers, and their surroundings. So if we think about the relationship behavior side of things, well, that's what we might think about emotional intelligence. If you've developed some skills and emotional intelligence, then you're going to be better at, at at relationship behaviors. But as I said, an appropriate balance is needed, and and so while while you've got individual productivity with a task fo focus, if you if you're needing team productivity, then it's important to have a, a enough relationship focus because the more relationship focus that there is the the better is there is for team productivity the the next one then was in 1950s uh, was also in the 1950s was when they came into the because the the behavior based was 1940s to 1950s and the in 19 the 1950s then they started working on situational leadership theory and or contingency theories and that's basically saying, all right, so we've got these behavioral skills, we've got these task oriented, we've got these relationship oriented behaviors, but you know, the, the situation really matters because if I'm in one situation, I'll behave this way. If I'm in another situation, I'll behave that way. I'm, I've got some slides later that are going to uh, coming up that are, that talk about these. So I'm not going to go on. I'm not going to talk more about that particular, those particular ones. Then there's then more recently then is it, it are the transactional leadership or transformational leadership. It's not that these didn't exist before. It's just that people are saying, well, all right. So if it's not situational contingency because they that sort of has gone by the wayside, then maybe it's transactional or transform transformational. Transactional is more uh, focused on rewarding or reward providing rewards to uh, to get people to motivate forward or punishing them and so or disin disincentivizing them to and if they're not doing something what you want to want to have them do and that's what helps to motivate them to do what's desirable transformation leadership transformational leadership on the other hand takes a different approach the transformational leadership approach uses encouragement and 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 it, it and the leader attempts to inspire people and or doesn't even attempt to inspire people it, it, the person just does by the way they're acting by how it is that they're leading that's what that's what inspires others and that's what motivates others so so that's what transformational leadership is is about and how and what that's working on and, and and how that and and that's and this these two now are the ones that are mostly talked about. As I said, it's been there before, but we just never really, never really put that into a leadership leadership theory. The situational and contingency models were around for a long time before the you know for you know several decades before people started thinking. Well, okay, maybe there's another maybe there's another leader leadership theory. So 
so the leadership theories evolved from the traits, the great man theory and the trait theories, the behavioral to situational contingency. And now we're at the transactional and transformational leadership theories. And, and there's some others that are, some other people are suggesting different, uh, different kinds of things. Uh, that are, so there may be some new ideas coming, coming forward about new, new theories. And so anyway, so situational leadership is uh, what Hersey and Blanchard uh, were one of the earlier, uh, earlier researchers that developed a model. They called it situational leadership because it changes your leadership style will change depending on the situation. So if you've if you've got if, if you've got <laughs> there, I've got a toy at my feet. So <laughs> if you've got um, uh, people who are new, you know, a new person coming in, they don't understand. They they don't know your organization. They don't know your um, your uh, they and they don't have the skills then that's when you're gonna be directing people. And so if you look at the S1 and the red, the red part of this little, uh, this little uh, uh, um, descrip uh, description here, the image here, the, the, the red part is when you're giving direction, you're telling people what it is that they need to do because, because they, they, they don't really, they don't know and they don't have the skills. They don't know what they, they, they don't know what to draw the, the role is and, and the, and so they need to be told and, and ex, ex, it needs to be explained to them how to do things. As, as they get better at doing things, as, they're, as they improve their skills, then they want to be doing it on their own, but they still need to be coached because they they're, they're still going to be told, yep, you're, yes, you're doing it well. Yes, yeah, you're right on. This is how you're doing it. Absolutely. Give them encouragement in that. So they still need some high direction, but their skills have improved so you can change the type of leadership that you're providing there. The next one then is once they've, once they've got more confidence, they, they know the job better. They know the roles better. And they're and they're much more confident in what it is. Then you can reduce the direction. You don't need to be there all the time to make sure that they're doing things correctly because you know that they know what what's going on. And so that's when you can shift your leadership style to a supporting role. So the the people then are participating in 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 um, in the task that they're supposed to be doing. They they know what's going on, and your role you can you can back off your role and you can focus on other people, new people coming in, where you need to be do, doing the directing or the coaching. And and once you're confident in that, once you're confident that you've supported them for for enough, then then you can reduce your you reduce your supportive behavior, and basically you can delegate tasks to people, and 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 that's because you know that they have the skills. And they have the ability, and they don't need to be motivated because they are motivated to do it. So this is an example of how situation, the situational leadership ap applies. There's a, and, and that's a Hersey and Blanchard model. They basically focused on that. I I have in here informal and formal. And so, what I w wanted to mention is about informal and formal is when we're talking about people providing the direction or the coaching or the supporting or the delegating, there is formal leadership where, where it's your, your job role is in some sort of leadership. And, and there's informal role where your job role is not to be providing le leadership, but you could be. And people might look to you for support. So it might be that that you're happily working, working, and and you see you, you know, a new person coming in, and because you're nice, you help them out. So that's informal. That that's informal. You're you're helping them out. What can happen over time is that if you are informally providing direction or coaching or supporting or delegating, well, you you wouldn't be delegating because you wouldn't have the authority to delegate. But if you are informally providing the other three then then that's you can still be 
seen by the people as a leader, by those around you as a leader, even though you don't have the title of a leader, you don't have the role of a formal with, with formal authority to be a leader in, in the organization. And, and that's imp that this is important to know for a, a number of reasons. One is because, because the, you can, if, if you're, if, if you're a formal leader and you have the authority, that's fine. But you also need to be aware of who the informal leaders are because the informal leaders can, can support or sabotage your efforts. So you need to know who people look to within their peer groups as a leader within their peer groups. Those are informal leaders and you need to know who they are. So that was situational leadership, Percy and Blanchard. And here is another one, the path, path goal theory. And, and in path goal theory, it basically says you, it's, Situational leadership is fine. Yeah, okay, it, it's situational. There are situations, but you need to look on not the, not, it, 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 the, the way Hersey and Blanchard described it, they, they didn't describe specifically that you need to look at the subordinate characteristics and the environmental factors. So this path goal theory, I forget the, I forget the, the researcher that was doing this, I think it was Burns, um, path, path goal theory, focuses also on environmental factors, the, the formal authority systems, the, the primary work group, the task structure that needs to be happening. Those inform the leadership style that the leader will select. And some of this is done intuitively, not necessarily consciously. So just be aware that there are different leadership styles that, that similar to the, the, the situational leadership path goal has four leadership styles. And, and those four leadership styles will be selected based on the subordinate characteristics and the environmental factors. And then those lead to the focus on motivational factors. So that's a path goal theory. Uh, transactional slash managing leadership. I mentioned that's more that's more a management kind of a thing. Transactional. There's a there's a a, um, a theory called the TMX. Um, oh, it'll darn it! I it skipped my mind. The no, it's a leader member exchange. That's what it is. LMX, leader member exchange. So that there's an exchange between the leader and the member, and that exchange is what allows the leadership to happen. So that it's more of a transactional kind of a thing in, in my interpretation uh, than, a, than, a, than, a, than one of the, the, the next one that's coming up, the transformational. So transactional managing leadership in the, foods, in the food sector, I've, I, you know, I've, I know of situations that maybe it happens to be somewhat military-like in the food sector but it's not gonna work necessarily because you will have, if you use the, that, type of, uh, that type of aggressive approach, that a type of aggressive approach that, that could be used by some people, it intimidates people and, and it, they may do things when you are there if, because they know that they'll be reprimanded, but when you're not there, they won't be doing anything that supports you. So it's, if, if you or anybody that you know is in the position of wanting to use that type of leadership style in the organization, then that is a, that's a negative approach for something where we aren't there every time watching them every moment of the day. So just be aware that that's not a, a, not a good, not a good uh, type of leadership uh, approach to be using. It's intimidating. It, it, it will create a higher turnover, uh, cost the company money, um, a lot of other reasons why it would not be a good, uh, good thing to be using. Transformational leaders, though, those, those, are, those are leaders that are transformational leaders are leaders that are, are working to not necessarily planning it this way. It just that their approach to leadership is such that people will follow them and people will change themselves so that they follow them and, and follow the, the vision 
that the, tra this, these transformational leaders have. So a transformational leader has a vision and communicates that vision. The values of the leader guide and motivate others. And I think I, I saw in the, uh, I, I, I know I saw in the comments that the part about uh, integrity and honesty and, and those kinds of things. Though, those are the kinds of values that, uh, that a transformational leader, leader would presumably have. And a positive, I'm looking at a positive transformational leader. Things, they have characteristics that people like and, they, and, they, and people then will be motivated by those things that they like. The transformational leader will develop staff, and provide support, and empower them. And by doing this, they'll, the, the employees or the staff are supported and encouraged. They're, they're, uh, they are rewarded by recognition. And this, tree, this creates trust. It creates respect. And it leads to cooperation. And so these are, these are uh, good, good, uh, good uh, not characteristics, good outcomes from a leadership style this transformation leadership style because you want people to be to be feeling positive about their roles in the organization because when they do that then they, then there's a there are different types of commitment that come forth by those people in the organization a transform leader the transformational leader is also in innovative um, and they will and innovative in the sense that they will question assumptions they're okay with people asking questions. They're okay with people coming up with new ideas. They like that. They want that because they know that that's going to po provide a positive outcome to the organization. The transformational leader also leads by example at, by acting acting like a role model. They they the quote is walk the talk or practice what they preach. Those are another that's another phrase that's used for leading by example. And, and the transformational leader has, has charisma. Charismatic is the, some, some of the words that I saw and, and saw in the, in the chat. And, and there I see that Joyce, Joyce had lead, lead by example, the, the one just before that. But charisma instills pride and respect in others. And, and that charisma helps, helps people to, to be inspired by that. And charisma can come across in different ways. You can have people who are quietly charismatic. They don't have to be boldly, boldly, loudly charismatic. They can be charismatic in different ways. And, and that's so, so I don't want to, I don't want to suggest to you that, that you would have to be uh, boldly bold and loud. What makes somebody characteristic is that is charismatic is a characteristic that instills pride and that that creates respect be, from from the others that you're working with. So so that's what uh, that's what we I mean by transformational leadership. And these seven two four six seven these seven elements are are part of a questionnaire a short leadership. Uh, a short leadership sur survey that identifies instead of 150 questions, it's just got seven questions, and and this has been shown to to be be a, a good indicator of uh, people's transformational leadership skills or leadership skills. So that's why I actually had all of these listed here because it's because it's part of a part of a questionnaire. So then, then I wanted to come back, and, and so th this is this is then the uh, that's the that's the theory of leadership. So I wanted you to to be aware of where where we came from. We're looking at traits as the very beginning, and and then all the way down to now transformational leadership, which still looks about looks at traits, but it looks at traits, it looks at behaviors, it looks at situations, and it combines all of them in in the in this transformational leadership thing leadership uh, leadership theory this leader leadership approach because the the situation has to be incorporated because the the, uh, the transformational leadership knows how to work 
with staff in the different situations to creating respect, trust, and cooperation, for example. And so regardless of who you are or what type of position you're in, the question that's open-ended like that will, will, can, be answered, can be answered in the same way, regardless of whether you're being directed or whether you're being coached or, or whether you're being, whether you've had tasks delegated to you. So that's why, that's why, uh, that's why I think that it, it, that, that it, it makes sense that we've moved to this tr transformational leadership style as a, as an approach. So the research that I did in my PhD in fact, factors influencing food safety behavior uh, are, are, um, I focused on this because my management commitment, people were talking about the importance of management commitment. And so I said, what is management commitment? And so when, when I looked at management commitment, I broke it down into leadership. One of my questions was um, something about relating to leading by example. Uh, I, it talked about communications. It talked, it talked about a couple of other things and those collapsed together to become management commitment. And work unit commitment, the, the same kind of questions then followed for supervisors. Were they, were they walking the talk? Were they, were they doing what, uh, were they showing leadership in the, 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 in, in the situation? Were people respecting them? So those are the elements that, that are part of work unit commitment. So this then shows that management commitment is important. So leadership is key, uh, but work unit commitment drives food safety behavior. So we also need to know about the, the rest of the information. We've got food safety training. We've got uh, we've got working with uh, food safety infrastructure, which is the uh, food safety management system, and the people are rounding that. Now that's what drives worker food safety behavior. So because this, this webinar is about leadership, tra uh, food safety leadership, I wanted to make sure we covered covered this so that you had a good understanding of what leadership really is, leadership me really means, and what components are there. Uh, and more than just the characteristics then that we did, that were typed into the chat box. So the next part really is about communicating food safety. So we've got the leadership and how are we going to communicate that? So some of the some of, one of the a classic a classic description of communication is that there's a message as a person that has a message you want to give across that comes across through a channel or a medium whether uh, the channel be a through the internet uh, or you know through digital sort of a system or whether it's a hard copy or whether it's by voice so people are hearing it somehow or other there's a channel or a medium and then there's feedback and so this is a, a classic and standard uh, model of communication message feedback and then the feedback then becomes a message from the one side to the to the receiver so there's a receiver and a, there's a sender and a receiver in in both ways so what challenges i there's not a chat message for you what challenges do you have communicating food safety with other management uh, with upper management just a, just a couple of words just a, if you if you have any challenges what what do you think the challenges are because we're thinking about food safety leadership and, and we're going to need to be communicating food safety with upper management. So maybe Simon, if you can read some of the chat, chat messages coming through. Is that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, management commitment, not understanding risks. Uh, getting up a management to participate, egos, talk with talk, participation, rejection. Sometimes they're busy, uh, management commitment and communication, ignoring it, time, delayed responses, need more presence on site, uh, leading by example, not getting responses quickly, uh, telling them they don't want to hear, absent ownership, never around. Uh, they never understand our practice food safety daily. Uh, lack of understanding of food safety requirements. Uh, inconsistent. Uh, aligning goals. <coughs> okay. Me. So yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So this this is this is uh, good. I'm glad, glad we're getting this kind of feedback. So so we uh, so we've got things like they don't understand the risk. They don't understand the food safety requirements. 
they're maybe not even there, they don't seem to care, they're ignoring things, they're not responsive. Yeah, so those kinds of things are, are challenges that we, we, we sometimes have with, uh, with communicating with other management. And so we don't exactly know, but sometimes there's noise, whatever that noise happens to be. That noise could be it could be a you know if it's if it's a a, a digital digital connection it could be a, it could be poor internet connection um, it could be that somebody somebody is hard of hearing it could be that they're in the plant but there's so much going on I can't hear what's going on you know there's or, or maybe maybe something is written and and somebody doesn't have good reading skills maybe it's in one language and I mine is another so. So these are the kinds of things that can that can cause noise or or create a, a barrier in communication. So barriers to communication. Some of you already mentioned this physical environmental. That's the, the kind of thing like say there's too much noise there. Noise be just been from the environment um, linguistic or language that I mentioned. Sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes there are cultural differences. So if I'm communicating to upper management the my culture my way of communicating might not be uh, uh, understood or appreciated by upper management when I'm trying to trying to com communicate with them. Maybe there's an attitudinal barrier. Maybe that's what it is about their they're not why that's why they're not being not being responsive. Maybe that's why they're ignoring things. There could be psychological uh, issues that are barriers to communication, or it could be organizational issues because we're supposed to follow a particular a particular uh, uh, direction or path and we actually need to speak to the higher ups but we can't get there if there's a if the if the hierarchy in the organization is uh, is made that way and so so there are a number of different barriers but we we so we can be aware of them and as food safety leaders we need to be able to not just be aware of them we need to we need to get it we need to we need to deal with things and we need to change so you know, we're the leaders, we need to change and adapt. We need to find out what the others need. So if we're speaking to upper management, we need to be able to speak the language of business. We need to be able to think strategically. We need to be able to speak about enterprise risk management. We need to, or maybe it's not even enterprise risk management, maybe just risk management for the plant if it's a small operation. But we need to speak in the in the language that the business uh, leaders that the that the senior leaders understand they understand risk they understand um costs they understand return on investment and those kinds of things so as food safety specialists if we keep trying to hammer them to hammer the message out that well we need to be in compliance we're not in compliance we need more money so we can get more e equipment so we can we can uh pass the inspection or so we so the microbiology counts aren't so high that nece doesn't necessarily communicate to the that doesn't help when you're trying to speak the language of business you've got put it into language of business is when you're saying hmm you know if if we do this if, if we or if we don't do this do this or don't do this then then it's going to cost us this much money if we have a recall it could cost us a hundred thousand dollars if we have a recall, or it could cost us, you know, what whatever a hundred million dollars, depending on how big your operation is. So you speak the language of business, speak the language that the senior managers understand. Similarly, if you're trying to communicate with with your with your co-managers, your your managers across your, your if you're a food safety manager. And you're trying to speak, speak, uh, trying to get the idea across to the to production manager. That's when you have to speak the production manager's language. It doesn't necessarily help them if you're only speaking in food safety terminology. You've got to communicate in a way that they understand. So it 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 because you're the one that wants to get the message across, then you're the one that has to change. They're not gonna they're not gonna think they don't think they need to change. But if you can speak the language of your peer, the language of production, the language of, of, of um, maintenance, the language of research and development, the, they speak in the terminology so that they can understand and that they can then 
they know where you're coming from and they can understand the importance of it, it from the from the from their perspective and what their key KPIs are. So you've got to understand where they're coming from so that so that they they can become come on board with you. I've just got to wrap up quickly here because in five minutes we're we're done. So then and then if you're with your subordinates, you've got to speak the language of your people. And and that means talking about food safety, but speaking about food safety in a way that they understand. Maybe they don't have the advanced training that you have. So communicate with them in a way that they will understand what it is that you're trying to get across. So essentially then effective communication, whether it's interpersonal communication or company-wide, you wanna connect with employees, you wanna connect with your peers, you wanna connect with upper management. You also ideally will get feedback and input from them. You know, the idea is to share ideas and get feedback from them. So you can give them information, but you also want to receive information so that you under, you know whether your message is, is getting across. And, and then I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this one because I have another uh, one at the end, but just think about this one for future. You can, if you have a chance, you can type that in. So how successful has your organization been at implementing change? One of not very and 10 of highly, and what made it that way? Then while you're typing in the chat, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep going. And I wanna mention to you about the three stages of change. This is Kurt Leuven's uh, idea, or actually I read more recently that it wasn't his idea that somebody else put it into these, these uh, components for him after he died. So he, the first part is unfreezing. It's basically, it's uh, knowing, creating an awareness that, uh, that, there's, that there is a, a need for change and and after you've created that awareness that needs for change and you've you've uh, communicated that you've you've basically made it so that people in the organization know that some change is coming and that it needs to needs to happen because it's important for example we've got to implement a new new uh, revise our food food safety system because uh, gfsi requirements whatever it happens to be and then then there's a middle part is the change that's the that's the part where where we're implementing the changes. So the unfreezing part is creating awareness and creating a plan, developing a plan, getting people on board. Then there's the implementation phase of the change. Then in, during that implementation phase, that change, that's when you are changing people's habits. And after you've when you've changed people's habits habits, then after a time, it's just like you, you know that you, it's hard to, for you to change your habits. So you, after a period of time, you're changing your habits, and then we we solidify those habits in the refreeze part, with, which is again I mentioned is is credited to Kurt Kurt Lewin. So so that's the three stages of change, and in each of these stages, there's a whole lot of stuff. So it seems simplistic, but there's a lot of detail that can go with each of these particular stages of change. And communication is one of these key parts. So when you're communicating change, you need to know who in your organization is, are going to be early adopters. Who are the people who, who catch, who, 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 who uh, agree with the, the ideas that you're coming forth? Who are the ones that can, that can adopt new things and then will tell people about it? And those are the people on the far left, not quite the far left, but the, the uh, almost the far left of this of this curve, those are the people you want to get on board. And when they're on board, then they will help to influence the rest of the people. And as they are influencing the rest of the people, then the early majority will also start adopting the, the, that change that you've wanted to implement. And it does take time. Some people are a little bit slower to, to want to, want to uh, make the changes because they like the way they were. They, they, for whatever reasons they, they have, um, they're, they're slower to adopt. And then the, the derogatory term in this, uh, in this particular model by Everett Rogers is laggards. But we might sometimes, sometimes they're resistors, sometimes they're resisting the change. And sometimes it's that they've, 
they've identified that that's not the change that they want to do. And so if I'm adopting new technology, I might decide that I don't want a cell phone. Uh, I haven't, I was, I, w I already have a cell phone. So, but, but a resistance is when you're saying, no, I don't want to have it because I, whatever the reason, but, but non-adoption is a different, which, which you can do if you're not working for an organization that is requiring that. If you're requiring changes, if you've got people who are resisting or who are laggards who don't want to do it, well, then you may actually have to, to remove them from the situation. And then, um, but then again, I'm just want to want to switch this over because we we're just at the top of the hour. Uh, so what I want to just summarize is that change leadership and change management uh, there there's there's a difference. You're so okay, change leadership you're... is where you're leading it. Take take your time, uh, you know. Uh, okay. Don't, don't rush it. You're well, right. I you know I I do know that that uh, that people here have had their had their one hour of, you know, maybe they had one hour set aside. So what, what I, I there's not, we're almost done in this. Uh, the, the, the things that I skipped were the, were the, the in interaction. And we do have another interaction later so are coming, coming up. So, so I wanted to make sure that I had this, uh, the information covered as much as possible so that, so that people could, uh, could get that if they, if they have to leave. So change leadership, that's when we've got that strong, clear direction from senior management and and we're and people are aligned and we're all aligning because we're all taking a leadership role and we're aligning with that clear direction from street senior management. There's commitment to the change. There's consistency. There are people who are walking the talk, who are leading by example. And 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 that's so that's key also. And and there will be key leaders who are championing the change who are sponsoring it, who are actively involved in implementing, making the change happening, communicating the change, telling, telling everybody how important this change is, this, this new, this revised version of something and why we have to do this and why we're all on board to make this happen. At the change management level, the management level, then we're making the business case, we're asking support and we're, we're communicating up with good news and we're communicating up when when we're having issues. So don't you don't want to just tell 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 them, oh yeah, we're on track, we're on track when when we're not. Communicate up honestly, but clearly with the information in a way that they understand it. In uh, if it's your up to senior management with with respect to KPIs on what are the KPIs for this change initiative. So make sure you communicate up. Good news, as well as uh, as well as any other news that you need to communicate uh, communicate with. And and then another key thing is that employees, the all employees across the organization, are critical for the success of the change. So it's not just the it's not just the senior leadership. It's everybody up and down across the organization that whoever is being affected by it. It needs to be aware of the of the of what needs to happen, and, and and because they're all critical to it. So we need to maintain the desired culture. Because everybody is going to be responsible for the results. the The employees need to contribute to decision making and implementation because it is powerful. It is empowering because when employees contribute, they get a greater sense of of that they're part of it and and they they also get a greater sense of responsibility for making it work when you've got teams working on things then people solve problems faster more often you solve a problem faster than with a team than if they're just individuals working on their own trying to solve a problem and then continuous education and training of employees is a key to making sure that that when you've got a change a change initiative coming through for 12, 12 this is from a total quality management initiative this study that was done that make sure that you're providing education and training of employees so that they know what their tasks are they know what the the new things they are they're supposed to be doing and also give them the opportunity give them the time to create the new habits because they need the time to create new habits they you don't create a new habit in a day so they need time productivity may decrease and you also need to be aware of that and production needs to be aware of that too. If there's a change, there may be a de decrease in productivity. Not everybody is aware of that. They provide training, 
But if if uh, if we're expecting behavior cha to change, then we're going to have a drop in productivity as that behavior then is changed and then moves on to improve productivity. So then in summary for food safety leadership, they, 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 these are the five tips. Have a vision for food safety. If you're a food safety uh, manager, director, uh, whatever your role is, a leader in food safety, have a vision for food safety in your organization. And consider ways that you can communicate that to, to, the, in, to, to the others in your organization or how you can uh, have that, uh, how you can influence, influence the others around you in, in that way. Uh, c communicate effectively. Consider that there are, that there are different languages, there are different, uh, different barriers to receiving information. There, there are, uh, you know, as, the, as that slide that I showed you uh, has that, you need to take that into consideration and that you need to change your communication so that other people will understand it. Then develop support and empower people, whether it's your subordinates or the people around you, encourage the development and, and, the, and the empowerment and in whatever way is you can support them to, to understand food safety and to adopt the food safety things that you would like, activities or skill, not the tasks that you would like them to adopt. Understand the change process. Understand that there are those three, three, le three areas. You have to have the awareness raising and the, and the rationale for why it's important all the way through to giving time to have the, the habits be formed and, and for, for the, the change to stick. And then finally, lead so others want to follow you. So that's those are the five tips that I have in summary of the of the presentation. But now I said there was going to have another action item for you. So these are your action steps. I'd like to I'd like you to think about the the presentation that I've given and 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 ask what is the most valuable nugget of information that you got from today, today's webinar? And I'd like you to just chat, type that in the chat box. What's the most important piece of information that you're gonna take away? Maybe Simon, you can read, read them off as they're coming in. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh... How to effectively communicate with upper management, communication, uh, communication, leadership behaviors, uh, talking in their language, three stages of implemented change, uh, transformational leadership, uh, a lot of communication, to be honest with you, uh, uh, and speaking in their language, um, have a vision for food safety. Uh, lead by example. Uh, yeah. Uh, All right. Yes. Good. Good. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you gained gained these these insights, these uh, nuggets of information. And now that you've identified those nuggets of information, because you've been here for an hour, an hour, what action will you take as a result of this webinar? Remember, I told you at the beginning. You can do training, but if you don't if you don't do something with the training and the information that you that you've uh, spent time learning, then then it's not useful. So, what action will you take as a result of this web webinar? When will you start, and what support will you need? Uh, share the webinar with upper management. That's not a bad idea, actually. Okay. Uh, and when? Okay. And when you're going to do that? Uh, well, we'll be sending the recording later today. So oh, there we go. Yes, so, that's yeah. Uh, circulate it. Uh, um, yeah, share with colleagues. Um, you need to start as soon as possible, I guess. Yes. 
Strike while the iron's hot. Absolutely, yes. Um, That's right. So it's important. If so, if you're if you if you've had a learning, and you've learned something, and you that you have an idea about how to implement it, that the best thing to do is to is to is to make the take the action as soon as you can within put it in your calendar so that you that you actually get it done because otherwise it'll be a week from now and you'll have forgotten that you even attended this webinar or you'll be on so something else you'll be there'll be some other kind of a reactive situation in your operation and and you may forget then to take any some any action at all from from having been here okay so um, yeah okay thanks Britta brilliant i mean obviously we've gone over by uh, quite a bit uh i think i don't know if you'd be up for it but maybe we we organize another uh webinar at some point and we just do a q and a session you know like uh because obviously you've you've provided the information but i imagine we could fill an hour with questions about people's individual issues and how to address them uh because we're not gonna have time to do that today mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so maybe you and i can discuss perhaps doing doing that uh in the near future yes yeah that would be that would be okay no slides just come on and answer questions yeah. about difficulties you know um or problems relating to food safety leadership in your organization so yeah so brilliant uh Britta thanks very much for your time today I was laughing before with uh with the dog squeaky toy all oh, that yeah. it. <laughs> brilliant yeah oh. yeah she gives it to me and I'm in meetings and I'll be throwing the ball I'll be in a meeting and I'll throw a ball <laughs> <laughs> brilliant okay uh have a nice weekend Britta and I'll all right. uh, I'll see you soon. Uh, Thank just, you very much. Okay. I'm just going to put the slides in the sidebar. Uh, uh, sorry, not the slides, the certificate. Uh, and then you can download that. Uh, I'll be following up with uh, an email in uh, an hour or so. And uh, in the email, there will be uh, the recording, the slides, and the certificate. Um, and yeah. Um, Squeaky tie, a little distracting. No, come on, adds to the fun. Right, go and uh, share your knowledge with your uh, uh, seniors. And uh, maybe, we'll, like I say, we'll try and have another session where we just talk uh, and have quite Q&A about uh, food safety leadership. All right, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Take care, bye.